Thursday, Friday, Saturday will be the men's retreat. If you have any questions, see Jonathan Sonoda. At this time, John. Thank you. So we're going to be talking about meditating on the Psalms. It's an introduction to the Psalms. So I'm going to explain the notes because this is really a lesson, not a sermon. So these are study materials. So the first one, meditating on the Psalms, is basically an overview of how to inter uh, observe, interpret, apply the Bible. And it refers to a couple of others. One of them is interpretation of the Psalms using Hebrew parallelism. We'll switch to that about halfway through. And then there is types of Psalms. That'll be, I'll mention that briefly, but I've also classified them so you can do that. So these are study materials, really. Um, and I'll, ex you know, I'll just explain things as we go along and introduce the Psalms. <clears throat> so, what is the most popular book of the Bible? And, of course, you know, obviously it's going to be the Psalms. But it depends on how you ask the question. If you search, what is the most popular book of the Bible for Orthodox Jews, you will get recommendations. You won't get the popular. They're, it won't say popular. It'll say recommendations, which is very Jewish. It's what you should do. So, but then you go to Slate, and you pick the most romantic book and the most tragic book, and that's their favorite. So it's kind of interesting. But most Christian sites say it's the book of Psalms. And we'll see today why that is so. And I think part of it is there are portions that even unsaved people really feel are meaningful. I mean, the Bible's meaningful. And the Psalms are especially meaningful because they're so full of personal experience. So I'm going to start off, well, why do we meditate? You know, we delight in the Psalms. <clears throat> people delight in the Psalms. But so why do we delight in the Psalms? And we'll go, we'll talk about that. So we're going to look at uh, Psalm 1, verse 2, and I, I've got it up here. I'm not going to go into detail, but I'm going to look at a couple things. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. So this verse has two parallel ideas about the law of God. Delight and meditate day and night. And so you can because they use the word and and not results or because or anything like that, they, feed, they relate to each other back and forth. Thus we can see that delighting the law and meditating day and night go hand in hand. You won't meditate day and night unless you delight, and if you delight, you will meditate, meditate day and night. So there's a give and take between the two. So we're going to see, and that's, this is Hebrew parallelism, but we're going to see that... <clears throat> As you delight in the law, uh, law, the law, the whole counsel of God, um, because this is a preface. This psalm is a preface to the rest of the psalms. And so when he talks about the law of the Lord, he not only specifically means the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, but he means the whole counsel of God because he's prefacing the psalms with this uh, Psalm 1. So we can see that it includes everything Old Testament and New Testament. But we have to realize the more we delight in the law, the more we'll study it. The more we study it, the more we'll delight. And that is the truth that the psalmist is trying to give us here. There's more in this psalm. Uh, Lord willing, John will talk about that next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It is so wonderful. And we thank you for the book of Psalms that grows more valuable for each one of us as we experience the things that are in the Psalms. Father, thank you for your word, and we trust you to teach us how to un better understand the Psalms and appreciate them and delight in them and meditate in them. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So why we meditate on the Psalms? So here are some reasons, just taken from the Scriptures, they show us the Lord Jesus Christ. When Christ was talking about, you know, to the disciples on the Emmaus Road, he says, all th the, these things had to be fulfilled, and all things which are written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So the Psalms, like the rest of the Old Testament, 
talk about the Lord Jesus, but they really talk about the Lord Jesus probably more than any other book. As a matter of fact, it's the Psalms are quoted 68 times or more, or alluded to, in the New Testament. And it shows there's important Christian ideas in, in the Psalms. New Testament uh, gospel of grace ideas, especially centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Jesus quoted the Psalms more than any other book. So they are a very a valuable book to the Christians. And you will find most often when they just do a New Testament, they also do the Psalms. Because there's so much New Testament truth, even in the Psalms. The Psalms are a key element of worship. Uh, speaking to yourselves in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So the word psalms there is a reference to the book of Psalms. And the other psalms are, uh, other songs are songs that are made up outside the book of Psalms. So, <clears throat> but notice this. The key instrument for making melody is our heart. You know, a psalm is a song accompanied by an instrument. That's the definition of a psalm. And you get that very clearly from the Old Testament. You can see David playing his lair, uh, his harp, and singing. But notice the key instrument is not the human voice. It's not the musical instruments. It's our hearts. You can, do, you can have the greatest band forever. If it's not the heart singing, it's not Christian. So, and the Psalms, our heart is a heart book. It's very much from our heart. Matter of fact, James talks about it. The, the psalms are a key way to express joy. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. And he goes on to say, let him pray. But we'll find out the book of Psalms is a book of prayer. They contain a vast array of human experience and emotion. And I think that's why we love the psalms, especially the older you get. So let's look at the word meditate. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. So what is the word meditate? It's a ka, and has the basic idea of a moan or a growl. It's onomatopoetic, which means it's a, uh, it, it's a word that sounds like what it's describing, like bang and boom. Those are onomatopoetic. And so this one is, it's what someone does when they're meditating. They're going, hmm, what's this about? Oh, and then they're muttering to themselves. And, and sometimes you go, I really don't understand this type of thing. Well, you're muttering to yourself and moaning, and that's the idea of meditating. Only it's much more positive than that. But sometimes you, you run across, why did he say that? So most people throughout his history have not had a notebook and pen to write down their ideas. They have to talk to themselves about it to remember and to work on it. But we today, we have pen and pencil, so we can come up with a series of questions that we answer. And so meditating is really answering a series of questions. And it doesn't have to be as formal as this message is going to make it. But um, this, this is how I study and meditate on the scriptures. And I think the other uh, brothers do too. So there are three basic types of questions. The observation questions, what do I see? in the passage. The interpretation question, what does it mean? So once I've seen what's really there, what does that really mean? And then application. How should I respond in faith and action? So generally, you need to do these, um, you need to carry these out in order. Now that's not for the whole passage, but maybe for a verse, you kind of need to do them in order. You, uh, because you need to see what is there before you can interpret it. <coughs> you, you know, and you need to understand the meaning of the passage before you apply it. Because if you do it out of order, you're going to miss things. I mean, the Bible does say there is no God. But you've got to read the whole thing and observe it says, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. So it's important that you get all of what's there. So, and then you can interpret it, and then you can apply we often rush to application without really seeing what's there and what does it mean. And <clears throat> so, let's start out with making observations in the psalm. So, 
here are the observation questions, and these are not comprehensive, but they're basic. The genre, what type of literature is the passage situated in? What is the purpose of the genre? And w how is that genre structured? So, okay, genre may be a new word, but it just be means a type of literature. So we have different types of literature in the Bible. You have your narrative history, the book of Acts, 1 Samuel. And you have very heavily doctrinal books, the book of Romans. The book of Acts is not a book of doctrine. It contains doctrine, but not everything in it is doctrine. We don't go to Rome on a ship in a storm. That's not doctrine for us today, but that's in the book of Acts. So you, you know, but there are things that are doctrine in the book. And the book, so then the purpose, what's the purpose of the book? What's um, that's the next one. What is the, the bu oh, also, the book of Psalms has subtypes, subgenres, and we'll talk about those briefly. And you need to consider those in the Psalms especially. Now, what's the book, book purpose? The purpose of the book of Acts is so that you can see how the church got started and grew. You, and there's some principles of growth there. You, the book of Romans is the the very comprehensive explanation of the gospel of grace. <clears throat> and then you have to see the progress of the narrative. In the book of Romans, there's sections on why we need to be saved, how to get saved, and how to live the Christian life. If you're thinking, if you get them all mixed up and say living the Christian life is how you get saved, you've missed the point of the book. So you have to see where you are in the book. And um, now the book of Psalms doesn't have a progress necessarily. Uh, there is some, but for the most part, it's going to be the psalm itself where you see the progress in the subtype, when we'll talk about the subtype. And then you have to refer to other scriptures, what scriptures are quoted and are alluded to, because it helps you understand what's there. Uh, and then especially for the psalms, what emotions are expressed, and how does the writer respond to those emotions. So these are, you need to see what's there. And so let's talk about the genre of the psalms. The psalms are hymnals. They're the Jewish hymnals. And you'll actually see this in the, the headings. There are, script, there are headings that are part of the scripture. Um, and you can see them in those psalms. And as such, they're a source of example for our hymn book. And if you really go through our hymn book, you'll see snippets of the Psalms throughout our hymn book. And then many are prayers. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are in it. Probably most of David's are prayers because he was always in trouble. So he was always praying to the Lord. And thus they show us how to pray deeply, you know, beyond the Lord make everybody happy type of prayers to really deep, struggling prayers, which you find in the book of the Psalms. And then the Psalms are wisdom literature, how to personally know God, his will, and how to live his creation and kingdom. So that the wisdom literature is Job, Psalms, Proverbs, and the Song of Solomon. So um, that's wisdom literature because it's very experiential. All of these are very experiential and practical. The Psalms are poetry and express the full range of emotion, emotions, praise, lamentation, fear, confidence. We'll talk about that. And they can guide our emotions. And they're very experiential, and it, it helps interpret our experiences. So that we love the Psalms because it is such a rich set of um, songs and prayers. Now, since they're pro poetry, the Psalms have figurative language. And I'm not going to do all the ideas of poetry. I mean, I am an English major, and I'm not going to sit there and bore you with all of them, but probably the key one are the metaphors. The Lord is my rock. You know, he's not literally a rock. It's a picture. It's, now, it's mixed with true, you know, clear statements. He is my deliverer. There's, it's really not figurative there. That is, God delivered uh, David many times. But rock and fortress, God's not literally a fortress. But he is 
a fortress for David. And then similes, he is like a tree planted by the streams of water, that's Psalm 13. Uh, similes have like or as. And similes generally give how they're like or as, whereas metaphors just are very broad. But they're pictures. They're figurative. And so you have to interpret them accordingly. You know, God is, God is like a hen that gathers his chicks. God's not a hen, but it's a picture of what that hen does. Okay, then there's patterns. This is key to poetry. And the main reason there's patterns, you know, meter, meter and rhyming, the main reason there's pattern is for memorization. Because people didn't have books even until, until 100 or so years after Gutenberg, people did not own books. So they had to memorize them, and these were set up for memorization. And, but that pattern creates, a, you know, creates a d discipline to select the exact right word. If you've ever tried to alliterate you know, titles in a message or anything like that, it takes you forever to pick the right word that has a, starts with the same letter. It's just a real challenge. But it, it shows that the poetry is going to pick the exact right words. Of course, we know that from the scriptures, that, that the Holy Spirit picks the right word. But we can see that in poetry of the Psalms. And then there's expression through keeping and sometimes breaking the pattern. So <clears throat> the pattern allows for great expression, as we'll see. The, and, but when you break the pattern, you also tell the reader something. So the key pattern in Hebrew poetry is not rhyming, nor meter, but parallelism, where meanings or ideas rhyme rather than the words. And that, and we're going we're gonna, to, now we're going to switch the other piece of paper if you're following along in the notes. Well, and it's going to be some types of psalms. So this is the one with a chart on it. So there's the hymn, Joyful Songs Rejoicing in Circumstances and the Goodness of God's Provision. These are joy songs. Uh, Psalm 100. And then there's songs where there's a lot of thanksgiving. Um, and those are the praise songs. And then the prayer lament. And, you know, generally you're, you're in trouble, you're praying. The lament adds the aspect of, why are things going so bad, Lord, and don't you care? That's the lament. So there, there are prayer ones, and then there's prayer lament. And then there's confidence, songs that depict the Lord's trusty worthiness and our trust in him. Psalm 23, very obviously. And impre imprecatory, a call to God to send judgment on the psalmist's enemies. And you'd be surprised how many there are. If you look at the list, you go, whoa. <clears throat> well, part of it is David had a lot of enemies. But, and then the wisdom... Guidance and warnings, showing people how to live as God desires. So Psalm 1 is a wisdom psalm. Um, and I believe Psalm 90 teaches to number our days. So, um, and then the royal psalm. And we love these because they, talk, they all talk about Jesus either directly or as a, you know, as a picture. And, but they're, they're depictions of Israel's king, God as king, and the Messiah. And then how the writer responds. And they're, they're, they're really instructive for us how to respond to our, uh, the Lord Jesus as king. So we can see all these types. Now, what's important is knowing the type of psalm will help us understand and apply it. Because, um, it, you know, if you're in an imprecatory psalm, you need to know that. Because that, that is treated very much differently than what, something like Psalm 23. And our, fav our favorites tend to be the confidence and praise psalm. So, and then, as we experience more of the challenges of life, our appreciation spreads to other types. I mean, when we lose a loved one, um, when we face trials in our lives, when somebody betrays us, those are all in the Psalms. When I was a teenager, I, there was only one Psalm that I appreciated, Psalm 23, and I didn't get most of it. But since then, my appreciation has grown because I've experienced more of life. And we can apply some math. Now, we should appreciate the whole Psalms, but, you know, it takes, we've got to have the experiences to really deeply appreciate. 
we can apply some ac aspects of the imprecatory psalms. I want to talk about that. Just as some of David's enemies were enemies of society, we should pray for God's just judgment on the wicked and for the protection of the innocent through that judgment. We need to pray for that. We need to pray for justice. And you will see that in the psalms, the imprecatory psalms. But we add, as Christians, we add two things. We should also pray in such a way that the wicked we pray about would experience earthly suffering in order to change their mind about their wicked ways and turn to the Lord. We would, you know, yes, they're enemies of society, yet they still need to repent and turn to the Lord. And then, in contrast, for our personal enemies, not the enemies of society, for our personal enemies, we should love our enemies, do good to those who hate us, bless those who curse us, and pray for those who mistreat us. So that aspect of the imprecatory psalms is not for us where we pray destruction on our personal enemies. We do this. So quick review of the imprecatory psalms. So now let's talk about the meaning of the psalms. So here's questions for interpretation. What does it mean? What are the basic meaning? We're back to the main notes. What are the basic meanings of the words? You've got to know what words you got there. And we tend to do this automatically, but when you're studying the Bible, you need to see what the er meaning of the original language was, the Hebrew or the Greek. Most of us don't read it, but we can get strong concordance that will help us see which one is which and a better definition. And then how are the words, uh, and any electronic Bible software, you can get strong concordance. Now, how are the words used elsewhere in the Bible? Strong's concordance or an Englishman concordance shows you all the place that the word agape is used. So you can get a feel for how the scriptures use that word. So you see all that. And then you say which designation, which, which of those p potential ideas of the word fit in this passage? I mean, we, we have an English word called cleave. On the one hand, it means to cut something in half. On the other hand, it means to hold so fast you don't let go. They're like opposite of each other. But you can tell within the context which one of those meanings fits. And that's what you do. You say, which one of these idea, you know, basic I, uh, definitions of the word fit? And then... Hebrew parallelism will actually help us define the meaning of the words and the sentences in most psalms. We'll see that. <clears throat> and then we write a good summary of the meaning of the passage. This passage um, means, et cetera, et cetera. And we want, to we want to avoid including, I should do this. That's the application part. And if there is a command, put it in the third person. Anybody who loves the Lord should praise the Lord or something like that. You put it in third person and then go to how you can do it under application. But So let's look at Hebrew parallelism. So this is the other page. It uh, talks about Hebrew parallelism because this is how you, this is the key way of studying the um, Psalms and meditating on them. So let's Let's, I'm going to talk about the various kinds. I can give you the technical terms and your eyes will blaze over. I'll just kind of describe them. The most common parallelism is where the ideas are repeated in similar words, you know, synonyms. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Earth and world are parallel, they seem are similar, and all it contains and, and those who dwell in it are parallel. So, but they're not exactly the same, are they? Now, we tend to just see the one idea in the parallel lines and summarize them this. Everything's the Lord's. We tend to do that. Now, we don't always, but we tend to do that. That's not... The parallelism is to help us go deeper into the relationships between the two ideas or various ideas and see how they work, especially if they're similar. So... Let's, let's look at the ideas here of earth and world. The, the word meaning, 
you have to go, you get your, your strong concordance. Earth is a surface or land. Genesis 2, 5, and 6. It's the, it's the land surface. <coughs> and world is an ordered domain. And you have to, this is an implication found from 2 Samuel saying the world has foundations. Anything that has foundation is an ordered system. And you have to say, so this means the ordered system of the world. And actually, this is the one he's going to concentrate on in the next verse. But let's look at this. So the parallelism. The Lord not only possesses everything we can see on the surface or land area, things, all the cattle on a thousand hills, but also all the inhabitants that are in the world that the Lord has graciously made for them. He's made a world for them, an ordered world for the inhabitants. And we get that from the next verse. And we can see, you know, his ownership is because he has blessed the inhabitants. So let's look at this. For he has founded it, and that's the world. It's the one that's referred to last. He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. And you go, okay. Well, go back to where he's referring to. He's very clearly, the psalmist is referring to Genesis. The surface of the land was separated from the seas. And the inhabited world was given rivers to water them. Okay. What does that mean? Mankind needs water, but not too much water. That's what God did. I mean, you could also refer this back to the flood. You can't farm in a flood. But what... But you can't farm in a desert either. You need the rivers. God has ordered the world in his creation so that we get water to raise crops. These two verses show that the Lord is beneficially sovereign over both physical and personal realms. And these two verses show us why the sovereign Lord can determine who can approach him. Because these are preface to the next couple of questions. Let's look at those questions. If the Lord is good and sovereign over all, one must ask, who has the Lord allowed to approach him? Because you read these two verses and you meditate on them in the first two verses, you realize, I want to know that person who's done all these good things for me. So how do I get to him? That's the question. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? Now, of course, if you go into the history of this, it's probably David bringing the, the ark to um, Mount Zion. But he's expanding it way beyond that. So the question is, ascending and standing are parallel ideas. The Lord is exalted, so you must ascend. You have to ascend. He's not on par with us. You must ascend. And he's in a holy place, but how can you stand in a holy place? How can you stand before a holy God? These are questions these are questions people have asked through the centuries. They're not just a little ditty here. And the answer follows in the next verse. Now notice, we have a question verse and an answer verse. The Psalms use that a lot. And the Proverbs do too. So let's look at that. He has chosen, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. But it doesn't end there. We have to keep that in mind because he's going to define clean hands and a pure heart. And we tend to say, well, you've got to have clean hands and a pure heart to get to the Lord. In other words, it sounds like work salvation. But the next two verses actually clarify that, or next two lines. Through parallelism, the writer wants us to consider the relationship between clean hands and a pure heart. He uses the word and. He just joins them together. And so clean hands and a pure heart both have the idea of purity, but since the writer uses and, they must influence each other. A pure heart results in clean hands, and clean hands helps the heart be pure. And you will find this in life. You'd say, well, you've got to have a perfect heart to do perfect things. But you also find out that if you do good things, your heart gets better in a practical sense, not in divine judgment. But, and that's what he's talking about here. 
again through parallelism, um, <clears throat> ascending and standing from verse 3 are reflected and lifted up and sworn. sworn. We have to see that. Because, and the clue is, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood? Why did he use lifted up? Because it refers back to ascending. Why do we lie? Now, some people are just inveterate liars, and that's a different story. You know, that's a total corruption of, of the nature. But most of us lie because we think it's going to exalt us. It's going to get us something. It's going to get us a good. If you want to get the ultimate good, which is God, you have to ascend some other way, not through falsehood. And then um, swearing falsely puts, a permanent, puts us in a permanent position. Our standing, when we swear falsely, we have sworn an oath and we have now put ourselves permanently in a false position. And that's how you keep clean hands and a pure heart. You don't, you're honest with yourself. And you'll go to the rest of Scripture, David, Psalms, the New Testament. People who are honest with themselves realize they can't stand in the presence of a holy God. And those are the type of people that can come into God's presence. And you'll see that that's how it fits. And the rest, you know, the end of the psalm is the only one who can ascend that hill 100% in his own power it's the king of glory Jesus Christ so we've got a lot of meaning from the parallelism here it explains these three verses and um, okay such ascending by falsehood and standing keeps us from a true ascending and standing by being honest and realizing our need for God okay so there's a form of parallelism similar to question and answer is where the second set of lines explains the first. This happens a lot in the, in the, in the Psalms and Proverbs. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. soul. Now it doesn't say results in. It doesn't say because of. There's no connective. But it is a result. The second phrase explains why the first is true. So word meaning. Perfect means complete or sound. We, now that's where you have to go to the original languages. Both in Greek and Hebrew, perfect does not mean 100% right and good and righteous. It doesn't mean that. It means having integrity. It's whole. You know, when you've got, you got some rotten food, it has lost its integrity. Something else has gotten in there. So... <clears throat> How can you restore, and basically, if you look at this, the soul can be brought back to soundness, that's restored, because the law is sound. And there's much more to it than this, but it helps you start to see that. Now, he goes on and says this several more times uh, about you know, some other synonyms with the law. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise is simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Here's what we tend to do, and actually I read a commentary that did this. Say they just replace all those synonyms, testimony, precepts, commandment, with the law of God. There's... <coughs> The writer wants to see the different aspects of God's counsel and their different results. It will give us a much richer idea of what God's word does. Parallelism helps us see the law as multifaceted and results in multiple blessings. So I'm not going to go into this in detail, but you'd start to get an idea. But here's an interesting next verse. It breaks the pattern. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The first line does not have a name for the law, and the second line does not have a result. Interesting. So if you're meditating, you should start mumbling to yourself 
Why did he break the pattern? Why did he do that? Well, stay tuned, Lord willing, you'll find out in May when we, when we preach on that. So you answer that question through meditation. But it's there. That question ha- is there. So Now, parallelism can help us define the meaning of a verse. So this is a verse that is quoted by people, or a portion of a verse, who heals all your diseases, saying you shouldn't be sick. People quote that. Parallelism will help us to see that it's not, it's not about physical diseases. The whole verse is, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. They're soulish diseases. We tend to look at physical disease as much more important than the disease of our soul. But not this psalm. As a matter of fact, you can see... <coughs> that other, ver- other passages you c- compare scripture with scripture as for me O Lord be gracious to me my, heal my soul for I've sinned against you when we sin it damages our soul I mean our standing may be restored to rightness but we need healing we need spiritual healing by the word and by the Holy Spirit alright another type of parallelism is contrasting parallelism where the second contrasts with the first. For evil doers will be cut off, but, and there's your contrasting word, those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Now what's interesting in the parallelism, the option of an evil doer is not a good doer. It's one who waits on the Lord. And you will find, the book of Proverbs is just full of this. You go, why did he make that contrast? You don't even see their relationship. It's so that you sit there and meditate on that passage. So he, there's also figurative language here, and we don't realize that. We just say, wait for the Lord. But, I mean, so when you wait for the Lord, you sit on, you know, on a bench and say, what are you doing, John? Well, I'm waiting for the Lord. No, it isn't a literal sitting and waiting, you know, looking at your watch. It's a figurative. We're waiting for the Lord to do something. And, and, and if you compare scripture with scriptures, David wrote this. He was king because Saul failed the test. And that test was given in 1 Samuel chapter 13. So here's the background. Uh, Samuel said, you know, um, Saul... King Saul was going to go fight a battle. And Samuel said, I'll come in seven days, we'll sacrifice, and you can go to battle. And so, you know, seven days comes, Samuel doesn't show up. Uh, You know, he did it by the word of the Lord. And Samuel doesn't show up. The people people start to leave, and Saul says, hey, I got to make a sacrifice. So he sacrifices. The instant the sacrifice is done, Samuel priest shows up and he goes on to say because you did not wait on the Lord essentially your kingdom will not endure and I'm sure David thought of this of his idea of waiting on the Lord we have to wait on the Lord that is trusting the Lord let him do it we can't save ourselves we have to trust the work of the Lord as we remember this All right, so very briefly, applying the Psalms, we'll do more of this when we preach through because that's generally what a sermon is, application. How have I experienced or might experience the situation and or emotions expressed in the Psalms? That's applying it to ourselves. And here is the number one Psalm that I think we can all apply, Psalm 51.1. We have felt the guilt of sin and turned to the Lord like David. We need help. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, compassion blot out my transgression. Three words for grace there. Grace, loving kindness, compassion. That's what we need when we sin. We need God's gracious forgiving. And there's more to it in the psalm. So you can, you know, all of us have experienced where we just deeply 
feeling guilt and remorse for our sin. And we can go to the Lord in Psalm 51. How does the New Testament theology modify the application of the, the psalm? Because the psalms are Old Testament, there are certain aspects that don't apply because of New Testament theology. Christ has come and grace is predominant. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me, in verse 11 of Psalm 51, versus another helper, that he may be with you forever. So, <clears throat> David could li lose the presence of the Holy Spirit. New Testament believers cannot. The Holy Spirit will be with us forever. Now, we can grieve and quench, but we can't, uh, the Holy Spirit will not leave us. So there's where uh, New Testament doctrine modifies our understanding of the psalm or application of it, I should say. How can I respond in faith? How can I trust the Lord like the psalmist? We can trust the Lord to correct our sinful thinking. I mean, if you really had a, a bad session of sin, you've been thinking really wrongly. Or I have been, too. I mean, all of us. And he prays, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. We can pray that. That's a, that's a prayer of faith. You know, when I am so messed up my thinking, Lord, please give me a new heart here and new thinking. And then how can I respond in action like the psalmist? Be honest with our, about our sin. Behold, you desire truth in the inmost being. How can I praise the Lord, repent, and or change my course of action? We can thank and praise the Lord for his forgiveness for our specific sin. So, O oh Lord, open my lips that I may take my mouth and may declare your praise. You know, when we've been forgiven, we should, you know, at least tell somebody, the Lord has forgiven me. So I just want to conclude. The key thing is to study is the, the parallelism, but... <clears throat> You know, though you can benefit, and we do benefit from just reading the Psalms, when we meditate on it, especially looking at the Hebrew parallelism and look at, you know, looking how the words are used, we can really get some richness out of it. And if you'd like to practice Psalm 1, um, on one of the pages is a kind of a practice sheet. Um, and, so, you know, Lord willing, John, is, you're, you're preaching on Psalm 1, right, John? next week. So you can do some preparation if you want to. And uh, if you'd like a copy of the worksheet or any of the things I handed out, an uh, electronic copy, uh, it, you know, I've included this in the notes. You can send me an email requesting it, or if you know my personal email or phone, you can text me or uh, ask for that. So I'll be glad to send it to you. And, uh, you know, especially the West Side one, I may, it may take 24 hours. Um, let's pray. Father, we thank you very much for your word. Help us to delight in the Psalms. Delight in you, delight in your Son through the Psalms. Teach us in the days ahead as we take the Psalms to heart.